Right, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Max Delmar. I'm one of the members of the Federal School here. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to our ninth cultural lecture in sociological jurisprudence. Um, can I extend a special welcome to, to Roger and Anne Cottrell, who are here? Um, and I hope I won't embarrass you, Roger, to, to say, to, to congratulate you on your most recent book, um, which has just, just appeared, I think, hasn't it, hot off the press, so, so uh, called Jurisprudence and Sociolegal Studies Intersecting Fields. I say that, I give that a little promotion as well, because I've been promised a copy of <laughs> <laughs> So there we are, I hope I've earned it. Um, so it's, it's really an, a, an enormous pl pleasure to introduce our, our ninth cultural lecture, uh, Professor Rahel Yaegi. Uh, so Professor Yaegi comes to us uh, from Berlin, where she is Professor of Practical Philosophy with an emphasis on social uh, and political philosophy at Humboldt University and uh, Director of the Center for Humanities and Social Change. She's one of the world's leading critical thinkers. Um, I would say not only in terms of the practice of criticism, uh, but also uh, in terms of her reflections on uh, what it means to be a, a critical theorist and what it is to do. Uh, <coughs> her work is marked by a belief in, in the value of theory, uh, but in a tentative, cautious, um, restrained way um, uh, that places theory uh, amidst, not above, but amidst uh, the practice of uh, democratic political debate. Um, her work is well known for, for a number of uh, features. Uh, one of them um, is uh, the way she crosses boundaries between Anglo-American and continental traditions of philosophy. So in her 2018 book, uh, Critique of Forms of Life, um, she moves seamlessly, at least it seemed to me as a reader, <laughs> moves seamlessly uh, from Hegel to Dewey, um, from Marx to Putnam, and many others. And, and as a result, produces, a, I think, a really generative combination of pragmatism and dialectical materialism. Uh, another feature of, uh, that her work, her work is well known for is her ability to combine analysis and description. Uh, she draws on both ph phenomenological description as well as careful contrast and comparison to bring out a rich, specific experiential content upon which then she builds her critical practice. And I think this balance between analysis and description is especially visible in her 2014 book, uh, Alienation. If I can be permitted just to mention two features that have spoken to me, um, particularly as a reader of your work, um, the first is this attention to experience um, and uh, the patience, uh, I think, and care and remarkable psychological acuity which you bring to, um, to bringing out the complexity and subtlety of, of experience. Um, but also in the way you treat of experience, the process of experience, as a value um, that as individuals and as societies uh, we, we can meet, um, uh, can help create and protect uh, forms of life that keep enriching rather than blocking uh, that experiential process and allow us to learn, grow, uh, transform and change. Uh, the second feature, I think, is, is, is the ability to balance and keep in productive tension feature the theoretical dimensions that, um, that others might treat as dichotomies. So the given and the made, the passive and the active, the ethical and functional, and many others. In addition to the two books that I've mentioned, um, uh, Critical Forms of Life and Alienation, many of you I know have, have read uh, her conversation with Nancy Fraser on capitalism. Um, uh, and there is also, uh, I believe, a recent publication in German for now only progress uh, and regression, and I think it's from this body of work that we'll be, we'll be hearing about today. So, um, Rahel, we're, we're really delighted you're here, and, and uh, delighted that you're also um, staying with us for the workshop tomorrow morning, being so generous with your time, and um, without any further ado, I invite you to, to give our lecture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, warm welcome and, uh, of course, uh, this wonderful invitation. I'm especially honored that the name giver to this uh, lecture is here in this room and, um, yeah, I'll try to do my best. So my lecture concerns a topic that informs a great deal of current philosophical and political discussion, even if this may not always be obvious. It is about social progress and its opposite, regression. 
I am in this lecture defending the notion of progress and the notion of, uh, of regression. Um, and as some of you might know, there has been a lot of critique. Uh, so the very notion of progress has met a lot of critique. The reason for um, trying to make a point or trying to reconstruct the notion of progress here is actually not that I somehow still believe in progress. This is something that a lot of people would, uh, uh, who approach me would say, oh my God, you're writing on progress. Uh, do you re really still believe in progress? Uh, but this is not actually why um, I'm doing this, or at least not what I'm trying to do here in a philosophical uh, and theoretical manner. I'm somehow as far removed as possibly most of you from thinking that humankind is as to go ahead and move by alternating stages of calm and agitation of good and evil towards e ever greater perfection. This is Jacques Turgot in one of the founding texts of the modern idea of progress. Rather, what we um, are faced with is a multitude of interrelated crises that somehow threaten to overwhelm us. We are faced with an abyss of war, violence, and chaos of open exploitation and op oppression. We experience the resurgence of nationalist and authoritarian movements, which even raise concern that the progress of yesteryear can easily be undone. And finally, as burning forests and melting glaciers bring home the reality of the climate catastrophe, even to privileged parts of the world, doubts have arisen about the achievements of the Western world's supposedly progressive way of life and its economic system. But then, it's not only uh, the rage over whether progress has occurred in the past or will do so in the future. It is the concept of progress itself that is hotly contested. And as you will see in the next roughly 50 minutes, I will concern with reconstructing a concept of progress that meets this kind of critique, the kind of critique uh, that Ashis Nandi brings to the drastic formulation that progress is one of the most violent intrusions in our lexicon, or as J James Tully has stated, the language of, of progress and development is the language of oppression and domination for two-thirds of the world's people. Um, as some of you might know, the term regression has, uh, on, on the other hand, um, somehow re-entered uh, the scene uh, somewhere through the back door. And one of the reasons for engaging in this project about progress and regression actually has been that uh, I think that if we want to talk about regression and, and if we want to analyze the state of affairs and our current uh, state of the world in terms of regression, and I do think that uh, analyzing it in terms of regressive and or progressive movements, uh, those categories themselves, uh, uh, I would say is something that we should not uh, easily uh, just abandon. So this is the reason for uh, even engaging with the topic of uh, progress and regression. Um, and as you will see, I'm going to address the discontents, the critique of progress in the first part of my lecture and then uh, try to give you an idea of how to overcome those problems. First part, that progress exists is hard to deny. Until the discovery of penicillin in 1928 and the industrial production of the active ingredient in 1942, people could die from, by today's standards, harmless infections. In the Middle Ages, scriptures were copied by hand, a time-consuming process. The invention of letterpress printing spurred immensely the proliferation of written texts. Today, my laptop's computing power easily exceeds what was available for the Apollo 11's guidance computer from 1969. And only a few decades ago, you needed to have change on hand and wait in line at phone booth just to quickly call someone. Today, we are in touch with the whole world at all times. And my son finds it hard to imagine a social life without smartphones. He also has trouble imagining a time when women were not allowed to vote, 
children were legally beaten at school, and homosexuality was a punishable offense. That there is progress in some areas or some respects, even if it might, in Nestroy's words, sometimes look greater than it actually is, is thus a triviality. The less trivial questions are why and in what respect the developments I mentioned are not just changes in general, but changes for the better. What and who brings them about, <clears throat> and whether and how the various developments are interrelated. Is there progress? In some sense, then, this is a misguided question. However, whether something that corresponds to a strong notion of progress, as Peter Wagner has it, exists, and whether the many small or local advances, advances lead to progress in a comprehensive sense is up for debate. But then, progress is not simply out there. Progress is a normatively charged interpretive pattern, a narrative that serves to establish a particular conception of social and historical processes. When we speak of progress, we don't refer to bare events, to brute facts, but to our understanding of them, our evaluation of what has happened, and our expectations for what is to come. We conceive of something as progress and thus relate historical and social events to each other, thus constructing a process which we evaluate and claim to understand. It is very well possible then that there is no state in world history <clears throat> in which things do not in fact change, even for the better or worse. However, not all of these changes are perceived as progress or regression. So what does it mean <clears throat> to understand social change as progress or respectively regress? How can the concept of progress help us understand, as Wendy Brown phrases it, where we have come from and where we are going? If going means towards things like emancipation, or at least away from the multi-layered crisis we currently find ourselves in. And does maybe the concept of progress itself, instead of enabling us, prevent us from understanding this? So my idea here is obviously that I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater here. It seems the concept of progress can only be defended thus if it can be reconstructed and understood in light of its most valid critique. Such a preserving or rescuing critique must first address the implications and political philosophical semantics of the concept and identify those elements that are in need for reconstruction. This is what I intend to do in the first part of this lecture. I will outline four central features of the progress narrative and explain the respective problems they pose. I will then, in the second part of my lecture, present an alternative conceptualization of progress suited to deal with the previously formulated critique without sacrificing the explanatory function progress and regression have for making sense of social change. So let's start with the four features of progress that I mean to examine. The first feature concerns the interrelation of various dimensions of progress. As my few previous examples should indicate, there are very different developments that can be understood as progress. Medical and scientific achievements, technical inventions, social innovations, the chains of moral convictions or political reforms and revolutions. In order to understand the political and historical semantics of the term progress, including the euphoria it was once able to invoke and the power it still has today, we must first disclose its original meaning. When progress became the guiding principle of the so-called age of enlightenment or age of reason, all the different developments it could refer to were conceived as parts of one comprehensive movement. Talk of progress did not refer only to the growth of individual skills, nor to moral purification alone, but encompass the improvement of human living conditions as a whole. Stephen Lukes thus emphasizes the confluence of the wide variety of developments that shape progressive thinking. I quote, the growth of the economy of theoretical as well as practical scientific knowledge and an increase in justice, virtue and happiness, all this hung together as if connected by an unbreakable chain. So my first feature here is the unbreakable chain. The second characteristic states that progress is an event that, as Kozenek describes it, takes place with a seemingly super-individual and irresistible force, 
and is accepted with an almost fatalistic attitude. Progress, as a consequence, does not seem in any simple or direct sense man-made, but rather an expression of that which is, to quote Hegel, bound to happen. As a simultaneously anonymous and historical power, progress expresses itself through and to the subjects like a transpersonal subject of action. The normative self-assurance of the protagonists of progress, the fact that they almost self-evidently evaluate the developments they face as change for the better, seems to be related to this irresistible dynamic. This assumption of irres irresistibility now leads to the third feature, which is almost inseparable from the idea of progress in its classical guise, the idea of a logic of development. According to this idea, progress is a world historical process that is normatively binding and follows a single and evolutionary pattern. Whether conceived as development or maturation, progress is then understood as a type of social change that follows a prefabricated and binding path. Tugo already hints at this in quite a revealing way. I quote, and if one looks at the human species from its origins, it appears in the eyes of a philosopher like a great whole, which, like every individual, has its childhood and makes progress. This idea of a development of humanity from childhood to maturity thereby implies not only an overarching context in which all the ages, all the ages are linked together by a succession of causes and effects that connects the present state of the world with all those states which, is pre which preceded it, as Togo says, it also assumes in an alienatingly paternalistic and imperialistic attitude a hierarchy of the stages of development. Finally, a further consequence of the idea of a learning or developmental process is the notion that progress is to some extent linear without losses. Progress overcomes the given and replaces it with something better. Understood in this way, no ambivalences occur nor is there a price to be paid for progress. Now, these four features of the progress narrative have all been decisively criticized. criticized. First, the chain, the unbreakable chain. The chain, obviously, is broken. The euphoric assumption of a solid connection, the unbreakable chain, between technical, social, moral, legal, and political progress that has inspired hopes of progress for so long has considerably lost plausibility today. Few still believe that the digitalization or genetic engineering will lead directly and by themselves to moral or social improvements. Indeed, there is a valid argument that the discovery of penicillin or the invention of the washing machine or the printing press did not, at least not per se, lead to improved social or moral conditions. After all, it did not follow from the map discovery of penicillin that everybody would be guaranteed its success. And we had the same uh, debate, of course, about the vaccinations during the pandemic. Walter Benjamin already warned not to lose sight of the fact that the progress in the mastery of nature can also lead to the regress of society. Current philosophical discussions are then mostly devoted to the dimensions of more narrowly directed moral political progress. When in doubt, we hope at least for moral progress, all the while technical progress is increasingly feared, albeit steadily advanced and constantly drawn on. Now the idea of the irresistibility and inevitability of progress, the second feature, which was nourished by the connection of technical and social progression, has equally lost its persuasive power. In fact, many feel this irresistibility in the form of an unstoppable compulsion to grow has more of an impending doom than a promise. The idea of progress as a quasi-automatic historical movement and evolutionary destiny independent of the will and volition of its actors not only seems outdated, but has thoroughly discredited the concept of progress. If we have been living in a fool's paradise, John Dewey wrote as early as 1916, in a dream of automatic, uninterrupted progress, it is well to be awakened. Today, we think of progress as the result of action. It does not happen by itself, but must be fought for. 
It is not irresistible, but on the contrary, beset by resistance and in any historical constellation more improbable than probable. Finally, finally, the notion of a development logic, a la Turgot, which is also commonly attributed to Hegel's philosophy of history, seems to determine whether the motive of progress is still tenable at all for today's critical enterprises. After all, a maturation model in which the various locally different developments are unified, subsumed, and reduced to a single evolutionary scheme of world historical movement leads to an intolerable hierarchization of the individual stages or developments. If progress proceeds according to a fixed plan and a binding, binding pattern, those who do not conform to it are automatically labeled as backboard. They are, and that is the core of every theory of universal development, not just different, but not yet where they should be. Those who do not follow the developmental pattern of the so-called Western societies remain, as Deepa Shakarati puts it into a powerful metaphor, in the waiting room of history. In this way, colonial relations of violence and exploitation are paternalistically justified, and the yet to be developed are led to their supposed happiness by domination, violence, and oppression. The concept would then be inseparably linked to the violent history of our global order, insofar as it presents itself as a dubious template for various forms of ethnocentrism and imperialism, as an instrument of Western domination that has been used to legitimize hegemonic claims to power and exploitative and oppressive practices, and does so until today. But this paternalistic and imperialistic moments echoed in the motive of humanity's infancy and maturity, and the related attempt to establish a general standard of development as progress is not the only strong reason to be skeptical of the interpretative pattern of progress in normative terms. This development model is also questionable from a social theoretical perspective that is as a theory of social change. So it's not only misused, but it's also a problematic theory and uh, misleading th theory. The idea of progress then as unbroken linear accumulation is also a poor compass for understanding social change. What it fails to accentuate is that with every achievement come moments of forgetting and unlearning and loss. Solutions to problems generate new problems, sometimes grave ones. With a newly gained skill, an old one may be, may, may be lost. And we may find ourselves facing problems that had once been solved, but whose, whose solutions are no longer accessible. So is progress a change for the better, hard to make out in world affairs? Is it that things only get different, but not better? Could it then be impossible to distinguish progressive from regressive forms of social change, given, given the shortcomings of the progress narrative? If all this was the case, we would have to adopt Michel Foucault's stance of what he calls methodological caution toward the idea of progress, what he called a radical but not aggressive skepticism that forbids us from taking our present for the end point of a progression and thus endowing it with a positivity and evaluation. This is Foucault. The question, however, is whether we can afford this attitude. And I mentioned in the beginning that one of the reasons uh, to uh, engage with the concept of progress and regression, uh, again, is exactly uh, the presence of what I would call regressive authoritarian movements, amongst other things. In the following, I would li like to briefly outline why we cannot stop at the critique of the concept of progress and what we lose if we give up the notions of progress and regression or of progressive or regressive social change altogether. First, as implausible as the assumption of an unbreakable chain has become, if we don't take the obvious connections between the different changes in our forms of life into account, then we fail to recognize what I would like to call the materiality of forms of life. The conditions of social change are then understood all too idealistically. Even if one thing, such as political moral progress, does not directly and causally follow from another, for example, technical scientific progress, the reverse notion that both are completely independent of each other is equally unconvincing. 
Altered living conditions bring about changed social practices, leading to new forms of coexistence and its normative organization. The reduction in child mortality, for example, due to scientific and technological progress, has clearly been a factor increasing intimacy within family relationships in the bourgeois era. The printing press enabled the emergence of a bourgeois public sphere that functions as a prerequisite for modern democracies, and so on. It is unlikely that the revolution in information technology, which not only transforms communication, but also significantly reshapes our life and work relationships, would have no impact on the social, moral, and political order. Therefore, it is one of the key aspects of my project here to reclaim a materialistic element in what drives and motivates progress against idealistic, voluntaristic, and normativist limitations. Secondly, the abandonment of the idea of progress would likely bring about a deficit in social theory that is especially alarming for a critical theory of society. Nowadays, faith in the automatic nature of progress almost only exists as a strawman fallacy, and trust in the supra-personal logic of history has long been replaced by the idea of contingency and a voluntaristic trust in the will and choice of individual actors. While it is easy to discredit the notion of auto automatism or a transpersonal subject of action, it is much more challenging to find a suitable interpretation of what unfolds in the interplay between events and structure, between the structural prerequisites of action and the action itself. Indeed, the answer to the question, who brings about social progress and how, is not, not straightforward. Social actors do drive change through their beliefs and actions. There is no fate nor a power that guides the world without the intervention of these actors. However, changes in society don't simply result from individuals changing their opinions and then adjusting their actions accordingly. And while it is correct to rely on social movements for social change, even these movements succeed not solely due to their courage and determination, but also because of other factors. Marx's insight that social revolutions have both active and passive elements applies here. They encounter preconditions, structures, historical opportunities, and are often triggered by crises and weaknesses in the existing system. That is, they must react to these conditions in order to act effectively. Thirdly, the historical philosophical approach to relegate others to the waiting room of history is, of course, not only highly problematic, but also, as I argued, misleading. But how is one supposed to think about societies in critical analytical terms without developing a narrative of some sort that can grasp their transformations as crises, erosions, revolutions, and processes of change? It seems that no philosophy of history might not be a solution either. As Adorno in his ambivalence towards the philosophy of history puts it, if we do not want to limit ourselves to the factual state of the world, we cannot do with the philosophy of history, nor can we do without it. And finally, while it is crucial not to approach the various temporalities and differences in local developments, from the flattening and ideologically universalist perspective of a universal history, we cannot afford pure localism and contextualism either, especially when we consider, as Marx suggested, that the world market is the world spirit. That is, when we consider the effective global historical entanglements and interdependencies. Precisely because the development of Europe as Gominda Bambra points out, is not the result of an indigenous process. And because, as Stuart Hall emphasizes, the history of Europe is all too often narrated as if Europe had no outside, it is essential to trace the mutual entanglements from a global historical perspective. Perhaps now it is surprising that I have not yet discussed the normative significance of progress when addressing the question what is missing when we abandon the concept of progress? After all, many authors answer that question by pointing out that we would lack a normative guiding principle capable of directing our actions. But this is not my most pressing concern. 
In my view, we lose more and something different than just a normative foundation for social criticism when we abandon the concepts of progress and regression. What we lose is an analytical and explanatory category. The question of progress, as Yves Winter aptly puts it, is not primarily and not exclusively a normative question, but above all a social theoretical and social philosophical one. This pertains not only to the criteria for what is good or desirable, but also concerns how a society functions and how one understands the conditions for social change. This very important aspect often gets overlooked amid those controversies about the normative foundations. <coughs> Progress is then neither a fact nor an ideal, as Amy Ellen puts it. I mean, she sees it as an ideal and not a fact, and I would say it's neither, an, neither a fact nor an ideal. It is, to put it in Marx's words, the real movement of history. However, in a Hegelian sense, reality then does not only refer to what actually and empirically exists, but rather to that which in its contradictions and crisis-ridden nature has the potential to overcome what exists. In this sense, the criterion of progress always accomplishes both, a comprehensive understanding of the existing and a critique that goes beyond it. Again, with Adorno, I quote, the concept of progress is philosophical in that it articulates the movement of society while at the same time contradicting it. Having arisen societally, this, the concept of progress requires a critical confrontation with real society. So, now I turn to the second part of my lecture. Towards a multidimensional and processual conception of progress. But how can we develop now an understanding of progressive social change that takes the critique of progress into account but still fulfills its tasks? Progress, as I see it, is an accumulative process of problem solving, of overcoming crises and contradictions, while regression is its counterpart, a systematically blocked process of experience or learning. The solution I want to propose is based on conceptual points of departure that I'm going to spell out in the second part of my lecture. The first is that I see um, progress as a process. The second one uh, relates to the scope of progress uh, and argues that if we experience progress, it is forms of life, uh, an ensemble of interrelated practices that change. Uh, the third aspect develops the idea of progress as a second-order problem-solving process, uh, which then will gain us insights into a logics of social change that is neither deterministic nor based on contingency alone. So first, and this is uh, maybe the most uh, important <coughs> point of departure here from my project, is the processual understanding. I do not understand progress in a substantial or essentialistic sense, but rather processual, as it were, as a process. Progress in this sense does not consist of achieving a specific and predetermined state or realizing a particular and predeterminable good. Instead, progress, in my understanding, is a mode, a way in which social change occurs, or conversely, in the case of regression, does not occur. To put it differently, the distinction between progressive and regressive mod models of social change is made by focusing on the how instead of the what, on how things change and how it is brought about instead of judging the results, the effects or the goals of progress. As a processual concept, progress denotes the quality of a development, a process of learning and experience and thus a particular way in which social transformation takes place. But in order to, um, uh, uh, to get to this understanding of progress, we have to, as I will argue, somehow get, uh, somehow free us from the grip of some misleading pictures with respect to progress. Progress, according to my thesis, belongs to the group of thick analytical as well as descriptive terms in which description and evaluation are indissolubly connected. In this sense, progress or progressive is a descriptive evaluation and an evaluative description, 
One would be meaningless without the other. The concept of progress shares this with concepts such, such as alienation, exploitation, cruelty, or kitsch. That is, with those thick ethical concepts that can be said to constitute the texture of a social world that is always already normatively composed and evaluatively colored. Now, if a widely held concept, conception of progress suggests that its diagnosis depends on a prior determination of its objective, this view is not without alternatives. Philip Kitcher, for instance, suggests that we should understand progress less as a movement towards a goal than away from a problem. Whether I'm following the right path on a hike or have lost my way can only be decided if I know where I'm going. I then progressively approach the mountain summit or not. On my way from the valley station to the summit, the sections T1, T2 and T3 are accordingly stage finishes on my journey to the summit and the progress I make is measured by the decrease in my distance from it. Progress is impaired if I give up and go back or if I take a detour and get lost. This is how some people imagine progress. And of course, there are cases in which this assumption of a goal is at first glance very plausible and quite unproblematic. Obviously, I can set myself goals in relation to which I define progress. If I set out to reach the summit, then every kilometer hiked in this direction is progress toward that goal. My running app notes every kilometer I've done in a section titled progress and adds it to the weekly goal set by me or maybe also by the app itself. But even this immediately plausible idea is deceptive. If I were, after all, suddenly beamed to the summit or a helicopter picked me up, I would still have arrived at my goal, but I would hardly have made any progress. In the case of scientific technical progress, it is obvious that the metaphor of hiking trails, mountain peaks and encouragement apps is misleading. The person who developed the first punch card systems did not already have the idea of a laptop or a modern large-scale computer system in mind. The inventor of the telephone did not think about today's smartphone. As undoubtedly as the invention of the wheel appears in retrospect as an indispensable step on the way to the racing car, it was not guided by the pursuit of the already known goal of modern racing. The path from eating raw meat to the sous vide method of upscale cooking or that from the cave to the skyscraper was equally followed without a defined endpoint. These processes can be, understand, uh, can be understood much better if they are looked at as progressive solutions to problems that develop from one another and are driven by new problems arising. Clean drinking water was scarce in the European Middle Ages, so beer was brewed. To solve certain problems, including those related to warfare, people were dependent on processing large amounts of data so they worked on compressing or increasing storage capacity and improving processors without knowing where it would end. Technical and scientific progress therefore moves from problem to problem and from solution to solution. It is driven by situations in which one wants or needs to improve something, in which the opportunity to do so arises and in which, if necessary, someone has an idea for solving the problem that proves to be productive and feasible. For this very reason, progress, to return to Philip Kitcher's catchy distinction, is not progress to, but progress from. This is no different, at least according to my thesis, in the case of social progress, even if problems and crises then are of a different order. Social progress, too, results from the occurrence of problems and the processes of searching for and finding a solution, which then give rise to new problems and, if things go well, new solutions. Here, too, the final objective is not known from the outset, and strictly speaking, there is no final one. Social progress is then not att attracted or guided by a destination it is supposed to reach, it is supposed to reach, but is driven by problems and problem solving, progress away from the bad toward the better, without the latter being predetermined or final, and without a predictable end. In the words of the Spanish poet Antonio Machado, a path is developed when one walks. Far from reducing the idea of progress then to a mere pragmatic muddling through, the pragmatist-inspired understanding of progress as progress of 
corresponds with the negativism of critical theory and also with Hegel's dialectical notion of experiential processes. In contrast to the vernacular, or as Terry Pinkett calls it, lazy reading of Hegel, the dialectical process of experience is not an anticipation of a predetermined outcome. Fred Neuhauser pointedly describes this for the unfolding of the idea of freedom in Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Hegel's argument, I quote, does not begin with a fully determinate understanding of what it means for a subject to be free, and then, with that understanding in mind, deduce the conditions that must be met for free subjectivity to be possible. On the contrary, a complete understanding emerges only at the end, and to the extent that it is realized. Again, with Machado, a path is developed when one walks. If the process of conceived change for the better, therefore, more happens, <coughs> if in the process of a conceived change for the better, therefore, more happens than the mere overcoming of a distance or a number of obstacles on the path to an already determinate and known goal. For Hegel, too, history is not, as Dewey falsely alleges, the mere unfolding of what is already contained in a certain situation. Rather, in the process of history, the goal itself is unfolded. In a decisive sense, freedom, too, does not exist in Hegel before it realizes and articulates itself in actions of resistance and by overcoming obstacles. If progress, then, is more problem-driven than goal-oriented, then there is also no independent good that dictates its direction in the first place and thus turns change into progress. And it seems that this independent good is no longer needed. The relationship of the good to progress can now be basically reversed. It is not that we only understand what progress is when we understand the good. We understand what the good is once we understand progress. The notion of progress has then priority over the notion of the good. As again Philip Kitcher puts it, ethical progress is prior to ethical truth. And truth is what you get by making progressive steps. Perhaps asking what is progress as a question about progress as a noun is then not properly posed at all. It might be better understood as an inquiry into the possibility of progressive transformation, about progressive social change that is about progress in an adjectival sense. What interests us in this context is then less the result, the good achieved, than the progressive transitions from one social state to another. It is the progressive process itself that matters. Progressive change, then, is a particular kind of change, namely one that can be described as an accumulative process of learning experience. The other way around, regression occurs when this process goes wrong or is blocked. Regressive change is characterized by effects of unlearning and reactive closure to experience. Progress, and this was my starting point, is change for the better. But that alone is not enough. In the search for a conception that is neither teleological nor deontological, and in which progress itself has a normative meaning, it has turned out that progress is not dependent on an already set objective. Understood as a problem-solving process, it can be conceived as progress from. The burden of justification now lies on describing this problem-solving process in a way that allows us to evaluate the quality of the problem solving itself. And again, such a process resembles the movement described in Hegel's phenomenology, phenomenology of spirit. So the evaluation of the quality of the process itself uh, uh, is somehow, can somehow be uh, informed by this as well. In the course of what Hegel describes as an experiential process, where consciousness changes both along with, this, with the object and the understanding that consciousness has of itself, this change is not an unconnected, abrupt alteration of the object or a plain refutation of it. It involves an expanded understanding of one's situation and self, the dissolution of self-deception and one-sidedness guiding this experiential process. The situation then is redefined and overcome with reference to a more comprehensive context in which it is embedded or with reference to the deficiencies of the previous description. The new, the progression, the advanced situation is the result of a practical meta-reflection on what previously existed and of its processing. 
Progress is not simply about making things better, but about making them more comprehensive in a reflective sense. It involves an increase in experiential complexity, while regression means a loss of complexity and the process of failing below a certain level of reflexivity. The history of experience that emerges here can also be described with Dewey, so again the Dewey-Hegel connection can be described with Dewey, crisis generate reflexivity that opens up new courses of action. This process of enrichment or accumulation thus should not be imagined as linear. It is mediated through crisis and their re resolution in which the respective social formations are always at risk of perishing before they transform. Accumulation should also not be conceived quantitatively. An accumulative process in this dialectical sense always involves a qualitative change. It is not like filling steadily a glass. It is the glass itself that changes in the very process. And most importantly, for addressing the concerns articulated above, this is not a teleological concept, not an unfolding of a pre-given potential and task. Accumulation of growth in this sense does not follow a preset path or a number of stages. So the next step here is an argument about the embeddedness of progress. And uh, to give you the idea rather quickly, what, I, what I'm doing here is that I want to redefine the scope of progress. In the perspective I will propose here, wherever we experience progress, it is entire forms of life that change. The practices at work in this are interrelated in complex, albeit sometimes only loose ways. They influence each other reciprocally or are made possible by the same overarching developments. So for example, when it comes to progress that is made uh, with respect to the emancipation of women, uh, what is important here to see that uh, those progressive steps, for example, in, uh, within uh, the legal relation uh, within the families or the legal position uh, uh, of women or uh, the way that women do or do not uh, um, have or have, have, have not influence over like the economical or I mean whatever, For a couple of decades ago women could not even uh, sign a labor contract without concept of, of their husband and so on uh, and so on. And so my, um, <clears throat> my point here is that um, those achievements that feminist movements have brought about are strongly related to a whole set of uh, change, changes in the labor market, in, this, uh, uh, um, in the legal understanding uh, of the person uh, and so on. So the other way around, if we ask ourselves why have certain things uh, been so, why, why did it go without saying that for example rape within marriage was not even considered a, a legal crime, then you have to look at all those neighboring practices and the way that uh, the <clears throat> those practices and those uh, ideas that are now uh, that uh, from today's standards are so I mean obviously <laughs> wrong. Why why this could be seen as normal and not as outrageous? Uh, this has a lot to do with those. Uh, neighboring practices and institutions and the other way around. Uh, if we experience social change and social change for the better, it is always a set of those uh, practices and institutions and an ensemble, as I call it, of those practices and institutions uh, that change and <clears throat> that uh, inform each other. Progress is thus conceivable as a complex mutual interaction of multiply interconnected ensembles of practices even if these development elements do not come together to form an unbreakable chain, we will still encounter fragile yet effective connections. And part of what it means to understand social change, uh, social change will be to uh, figure out how those elements work together, how they uh, inf mutually inform each other, uh, and how then social movements at, at a certain uh, point uh, somehow come in turning institutions that in some way are already in a crisis, erode in some way, are not uh, um, are losing 
uh, legitimacy uh, and social movements sometimes, or at least one of the, the important uh, tasks of social movements is to turn those crises into a conflict in order to bring social change about. Now, the third um, point of departure here, the second order problem solving that uh, uh, <clears throat> I said pro uh, a progress would be. Now, according to my thesis, forms of life understood as inert ensembles of social practices solve problems. Not just bare problems as such, but problems of a certain kind, problems that are already normatively imbued and historically situated. Forms of life are embodied reactions to problems, attempts to solve these that arise for them and with them. This is the basis now for understanding their dynamics and the conditions of their change. If they change, they change when faced with new problematic situations, crises in their existing social practices and institutions, which, as Thomas Kuhn put it, have partially, they have partially co-produced. If we understand forms of life as problem-solving entities, then we begin in the middle, meaning in a world already structured by practices and the problems that arise from them, amid a problem-solving process. That is history. In other words, people live and shape the material and immaterial, cultural and symbolic conditions of their lives. Problems repeatedly arise, rarely with definite solutions. And the more complex the situation, the less likely it can be resolved without creating new problems, as solutions typically generate new problems. This is a crisis-driven dynamics. How then do forms of life solve problems? They do so by organizing our lives and providing the patterns of action and the institutions in which we live and understand what we are doing. To avoid any intentional, intentionalistic misunderstanding, the fact that forms of life solve problems does not, sim, does not imply that they are subjects with intentions and capabilities. Instead, they are super individual patterns and here the idea of progress as somehow irresistible, as somehow super individual, not just brought about by uh, individuals making up their minds. They are super individual patterns of action and social structures that provide possibilities and constraints for actors. However, since social actors are the ones who, in their practical life, if not produce, then co-create and reproduce practic practice contexts, individuals need to be seen as active elements involved in both the emergence and the decay of social practices and practice contexts. In regards to progressive social change, they are the ones who turn a crisis into a conflict. Now the problems that forms of life, as forms of life typically deal with, and the problems that <coughs> um, then can uh, then lead, the problem solving that leads to progress, they have a specific form. They are typically second order problems. These are problems related to the conceptual and cultural resources available to a form of life to solve first-order problems. For example, consider an agrarian society that is struck by a famine because it hasn't rained in months. The shortage of food then is clearly a first-order problem for the reproduction of this society. People are starving. A second-order problem now arises when it turns out that for some reason the society is unable to respond to this first order problem with appropriate measures. Second order problems do not concern the immediate scarcity, which is a first order problem, but rather the practices and institutions, the social resources that make it possible or impossible to respond to it. If, for example, droughts, droughts are a regular occurrence and the society still fails to react with appropriate measures, such as building storage facilities, then this inability to respond, the learning blockage and structural hindrances that hinder rational engagement with the problem are a second order problem. In this regard, the governor of Utah calling for people to pray against the drying of the Colorado River in, in 2022 can be understood as a second order problem. If second order problems or crisis solidify, it is always an indication that established institutions, practices, beliefs and self-conceptions have become questionable and dysfunctional. And since the perception of a problem, to even conceive of something as a problem or crisis, is already shaped by the normative expectations that come from and are addressed to a social order, 
forms of life are caught in crisis due to normatively predefined descriptions. <coughs> For the question of progress, the following point is crucial. Social progress or regression does not occur with respect to solving first-order problems. It occurs on the level of second-order problems, where forms of life are confronted with second-order problems and can either cope with them or cannot. Coping with them would be progress, as you can guess, and not coping with them, regression. <coughs> if forms of life are involved in a problem-solving dynamic, whether they are progressive or not is not determined by whether they simply solve the problem, problems that trigger their development, but whether they do it in a certain, already normatively significant way. The question then is whether they possess the institutional resources and potential to initiate processes of reflection necessary to solve second order problems. The question is not whether they actually sometimes or frequently solve problems, and not even just whether they sometimes or frequently learn. The question is, whether they have learned to learn. Problem solving is then not successfully, successful simply when what was dysfunctional is made functional again. If that were the case, regressive problem solving could, at least at first glance, also be adequate. But a successful problem solving process is not only a readjustment and reintegration of practices that have become meaningless or problematic into a somehow functioning new set of practices. It is a transformation of the mode of learning itself, informed by crisis and enabling or rather compelling new experiences. Some of these transformations are continuous with the previous state, others cannot happen without radical or revolutionary change. Enrichment, growth and a successful process of experience then are processual ciphers for what lies behind the idea of progress. Accumulation itself provides the standard for the sought-after criteria of, so of progressive development. What is it then that has been solved with respect to the problems mentioned in the beginning? I presented you with a processual alternative to a conception of progress with substantively determined goals, whether they are global or local. With my proposal, the concept of progress is thus deflated in a specific way. Instead of limiting it to a particular context, I suggested relating the concept of progress to the overarching form in terms of the dynamic movement of events, making the quality of the described experiential process the criterion. This is some, a somehow formal solution, and the problem-solving orientation it suggests are neither global nor local, neither do they concern the entirety of the world history, nor just individual parts of it, because they are as such formal and not, uh, <coughs> um, not arguing with the uh, substantial effect of it. This has the advantage of opening up the possibility of a multiplicity of paths towards progress, or better, a multiplicity of progressive paths. Not one, but possibly many. Multi the multiplicity of conditions asks for and enables a multiplicity of solutions while we, ha we have to take into account that functional equivalence will be available. This makes for different paths, different trajectories, and then, of course, a certain kind of path dependency for those ways. There is then no waiting room of history, no developmental hierarchies or predetermined stages, but on the other side, it is not a relativistic position either. Second, Understood as problem-solving progress, as, as problem progress is neither an almost automatic development, nor does it rely on reaching the end of the course of stages and thereby presenting a preconceived idea of the qualitative details of a rational organization of society. A problem-solving process is not teleological in the strong sense, but it can fail. Thus, it gives us criteria for judging, for telling apart progressive from regressive social change. And thirdly, there is another consequence by understanding progress <clears throat> and uh, with respect to the idea of the unbreakable chain. With the second order framework, this can be made productive. If there are quite different problems that have to be solved within a social form of life, technical problems, problems of knowledge, problems of living together, political or social problems, 
the connection and the appropriate relationship between the different dimensions of progress can only be grasped on the level of second order problem solving potentials. Solving problems with technological advances, for example, is of no use if it cannot be thought together and made commensurable with the other dimensions of the social, the effects on social life and possible side effects. Solutions to economic problems um, can come into opposition with possibilities of solutions of social problems. On the level of second order problems, however, these are not separate dimensions. Progress in the development of productive forces that does not go well, to quote Walter Benjamin again, for individuals, but also not for the world. This kind of, prog uh, of progress that does not go well for the world is simply not progress. Progress thus becomes a meta category of social change, change within change. The question of whether a social change is progressive or regressive is then decided not least by the integration of precisely those moments. This is fundamentally a negativist approach. The non-teleological nature of orientation toward the dynamics of progress itself leads to the formal meta category of non-regression. I have now arrived at a point that again Adorno addressed in his brief text on progress. I quote, a situation is conceivable in which the category of progress would lose it, its meaning and yet which, which is not the situation of universal regression that allies itself with progress today. In this case, progress would transform itself into the resistance to the perpetual <coughs> danger of relapse. Progress is this resistance at all stages, not the surrender to the steady ascent. The resistance against regressive forces gains its specificity then and its direction from the progressive and concrete determination of these instances of regression. So what is it, and now I'm uh, at the end of my, of, uh, of my lecture, what is it that we gain from this idea of progress for the understanding of regression? My proposal is to understand regression as an experiential blockage and therefore as a deficient mode of crisis management and problem solving. If processes of progressive social transformation are those that can be seen as appropriate response to contradictions and crises, one can conversely speak of regression wherever crises are not addressed or dealt with deficiently. Just as progress, in my sense, does not depend on a goal, regression doesn't let us fall behind a predetermined uh, or set goal. In a political context, then, <clears throat> regressive positions should not be equated with conservative positions of preservation. Regression involves a return to or a clinging to something that one cannot return to in the way envisioned and that cannot be preserved. Regression responds to a problem with a sense of being overwhelmed and to a crisis with denial. If successful learning always includes an element of learning how to learn, not just learning about a subject but also reflexively understanding how one learns, then regressive processes involve unlearning how to learn. Regressive ways of dealing with experiences are not only inappropriate concerning the current phenomenon or situation, as an avoidance strategy, they block the possibility of further experiences which are essential for change. Regression is therefore a crisis in crisis resolution, a second order phenomenon. It is not the inability to manage a crisis or to solve a problem. Regression occurs where the means of problem perception and problem solving have already been systematically destroyed or rendered inaccessible. In such cases, not only do crises persist, but they cannot be appropriately articulated, addressed, and crucially for the dynamics of social change, transformed into conflicts. <clears throat> Referring then to achievements as progressive does not absolutize the status quo, just as referring to socially regressive processes does not mean longing for a return to the good old days. Quite the contrary. If everything has been, had been good back then, there would be no regression. Put in dialectical terms, regression is already inherent in the blind spots, exclusions, contradictions, and causalities of progress. Regression is therefore not a step back from something already achieved, 
but with Adorno, the prevention of the possible. They are not merely those who fall back behind an established state, but those who want to exterminate the admonishing possibility of something different, thus preventing emancipatory change. However, since progress and regression are modes of change within change, the alternative is between an appropriate and an inappropriate reaction to the tendencies, contradictions, crises, and conflicts underlying the given state. Socialism or barbarism, this was Rosa Luxemburg's very clear and unfortunately not entirely outdated translation of this alternative. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.